Welcome to PMP, the Partners in Positivity podcast, where Ashley Burnett and myself, Sarah Harty, warriors of EVP, SBP, DHBs, that's emotionally bulletproof, spiritually bulletproof, divine human beings, aim to wake up and shake up the nation through positivity, humor, and shared wisdom. Today on the Irish and international stage of our PNP podcast, we have another unique and supreme divine human being. Ashton came across this doctor in 2016 when she flew to Belgrade, Serbia to take part in his Reconnective Healing Practitioner Program. She had a life-changing experience from interacting with the Reconnective Healing Frequencies and it has always been a dream of hers to have the founder of this on our podcast, Dr. Eric Pearl. Dr. Eric Pearl ran one of the largest chiropractic practices in Los Angeles for 12 years, when one day his patients began reporting healings when he simply held his hands near them without physically touching them. He immediately embarked on a journey of research and discovery, seeking an understanding of the universal intelligence behind what was happening. He soon found that this can be accessed and learned by everyone and unlike today's known forms of energy healing is easily facilitated without complex technique or elaborate ritual. He called it reconnective healing. Internationally recognized and supported by science, the Reconnective Healing Experience is known to bring about healings for people that are often instantaneous and tend to be lifelong. Feeling compelled to teach others, Dr. Eric's work has taken him and his life partner Gillian to over 100 countries and has dramatically affected the lives of millions. Eric and Gillian's vision is that one day everyone will learn to access this innate ability and use it to heal themselves and others. Dr. Eric Pearl is also an internationally best-selling author and speaker who has spoken by invitation at the United Nations, presented at Madison Square Garden and has been featured in top media including The Dr. Oz Show, The New York Times and CNN. Dr. Eric's internationally best-selling book, The Reconnection, Heal Others, Heal Yourself, now in over 39 languages, has been endorsed by such notables as Deepak Chopra and Wayne Dyer. His second book, Solomon Speaks on Reconnecting Your Life, is co-authored with Frederick Ponslov. The highly anticipated release of his third book, co-authored with his life partner, Gillian Fleer, is planned for 2022. Partners in Positivity, please help us welcome Dr. Eric Pearl. Dr. Eric, thank you so much. I am so grateful. We are so grateful to have you here with us today. Thanks for doing this. How has your day been so far? I know it's super early in America. It has. No, it's not super early. It's 1130 in the morning where I am. So we're very good. But my day is already going beautifully listening to that Um. <laughs> Wonderful description introduction that you gave me. It sounds so interesting. I almost want to sit back and listen to what I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you listen back to us someday. <laughs> Brilliant. Or listen might. back to yourself. Brilliant. And I'm enjoying your 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 interaction together is 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 so beautiful. I watch how um subtly, you know, you adjust each other's microphone heights and things and look into the camera so no one should notice. <laughs> of course, they wouldn't have if I didn't say anything. But <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Yeah, we pride ourselves on being a good partnership. <laughs> yeah, you are. <laughs> Thanks so much. Dr. Eric, can I call you Dr. Eric or Eric? You can call me Dr. Eric or Eric, whatever you'd like. <laughs> Perfect. Just to get started with something lighthearted, it's a question we ask to all of our interviewees and we'd love to hear your opinion on this. We want to know, because the podcast is called Partners in Positivity and that's our focus, positivity, what does positivity as a word, as a concept mean for you? You know, positivity is a funny word with... Um, certain meaning to the general public and then different layers of meaning and different layers of meaning if you come from a healthcare background you know being a doctor um being a doctor of chiropractic positive isn't always desirable 
You know, it could mean you went in and you tested positive for this, or you tested positive for that. So that's not always lovely. And sometimes, you know, and prior to, um, you know, medical training and chiropractic training, the, um, the word positive only meant wonderful sounding things. Then um, in observing people, There's a concept of positivity that people, some people want it so much that they constantly remain intentionally trying to maintain it. And intention is such a popular word, you know, you want to heal for the intention that you want, you want this, you want to intend to be positive. Intention requires a lot of attachment a lot of work, a lot of effort. So just to go to the basic where I started, um, I have known some people that always tried to be so positive that it was sometimes not only exhausting for them, but exhausting for people around them. Um, and yet what your meaning of it is, as I'm sure most people get, it, is something wonderful. With Jillian and I working on the second book, and my nature anyway, um, or working on our first book together, be my third one, um, words have different levels of meaning, and you need to pay attention to them. And no matter how careful you are, you can say the same thing to three different people, and they will receive it three different ways. Um, as I remember once hearing Deepak Chopra say, I could pay you a compliment and you could choose to feel complimented or you could choose to be insulted by it. I could insult you, you could choose to be insulted, you could choose to feel complimented. So partners, <laughs> I love that. Partners in positivity I think you're bringing forth your meaning most when we bear in mind the way different words can be interpreted differently and then share that. I know that when Jillian and I write or when we speak, we start with a group of people and then we lead them into different words, different ways of expressing things different meanings that allow for a greater understanding of oneness, let's mm -hmm. say. And when we start using certain words, we need to periodically explain them or re-explain them when people who are new join our gatherings. Different thoughts we think of. Well, first, let, let's just use a common everyday one that doesn't even have to do with healing or anything. There's an expression, I don't know if you use this um, mm -hmm. in Ireland, but in, in the United States and a lot of people will say, you know, if you're coming up on a weekend or a holiday, they say, well, if I don't see you before the, you know, if I don't see you before um, Christmas, have a wonderful holiday or have a wonderful week. Do you say things like that? Yeah. And what I think is, oh, well, I hope you don't see me before Christmas so that, because I do want to have a wonderful week. And you just told me, if you, if you don't see me, I can <laughs> have one. So if you do, I better look out. What are we saying? And we don't always listen. Um, in the healing world, we talk about sending a healing. And yet sending is a separation. Yeah. I can't yeah. send you something unless I am here and you were there. Mm -hmm. Unless I am one person and you are another person. Sending lots of love is a beautiful thought as it is intended, but it also implies separation that we are no longer or not actually one. Connecting, connection, we are all connected sounds good, but to be connected, you have to be two. You need two to connect. When you are one, there's no connection because you mm. are. So you see, what's the level of depth you, we want to explore our communication or can we reach a level of understanding that maybe our words shift? What is oneness? It's unity, it's love. 
when we send something, it's that separation concept. Separation implying otherness creates concepts, for example, let's jump right to this one, of fear or insecurity. Mm. This is part of the reason that, you see, reconnective healing is not a technique. Reconnective healing experience is not experienced through technique. It's we I guess the closest word we can come to it, it's it's an approach healing, but it's not a technique. A technique is you do step A, you do step B, you go clockwise, you go counterclockwise, you do this, or you do that, or you do it the other way. And then if you're going clockwise and you're flying to um, Australia, when you cross over the equator, do you have to go the other direction? I mean, you know, there's all these crazy things. Um, it's oneness, it's unity. So you receive, if you want to send, do you send something to yourself? How can you? I mean, you stand on one side of the room, you send it, run to the other side of the room and catch it. You are you, you simply receive. So we receive as oneness. You are me, I am you. We receive, we are one being. And there's no fear in that. There's no need for protection in that. In a relationship that is true love, do you protect yourself? No, you don't protect yourself. What are you protecting yourself from? Love? Mm -hmm. Of course not. Whenever there's a protection, there is fear. You know, in the healing world, um, so many techniques say, you know, do this to protect yourself, do that to protect yourself, wear this to protect, wear that to protect yourself. And all that really does is it brings about cognizantly or subliminally the concept of fear. And people say, oh, no, no, we're protecting ourselves out of love. Really? I don't protect myself from anything that I'm not afraid of. Why would you protect yourself from something if there is no fear? And does healing reside in love? Or does healing reside in fear? Mm. So when we are willing, reconnective healing, the experience dissolves the illusion of otherness and allows everyone to receive. And when one person receives, everyone receives. The person you're next to who you love as your friend receives. Your parents or your kids who you may love receive. The neighbor across the street who causes you problems all the time and complains if your, your dog is barking too loudly, well, they receive too. And when because we really are all one and we see ourselves in them and we see them in us. And when you say that the people around you receive also when you go through your healing, is it because that you have healed and they're benefiting from you being a more evolved version of yourself or that you're approaching them differently or just in terms of energy that something has shifted? Did you first say because of the field? Is that the word you used? No. Oh, I didn't hear you. Say. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, listen, what's the meaning of around you? Is around you within six feet or within 60,000 miles? Yeah. Is Saturn or Pluto around you? <laughs> so, you know, here yeah. we are living in the world of illusion, four dimensional time and space, the illusion of distance, the illusion of space, and the illusion of time. Because you see, you cannot have distance without time. There's no yeah. way to determine it. You can't have time without distance. So any change, anything that you receive is received in beingness, our growth, our becoming more is everyone's growth and becoming more. How and why are natural questions. Mm -hmm. And they may be limitation just by question or discovery. Because as soon as we figure out how or why, we place that answer into our how or why box. Everything in that box is correct. Everything outside that box, uh-uh, that's not the how or the why. So we feel we've got the answers and we look into our box. We don't allow ourselves to look beyond that. 
The funny thing is, are answers answers? Or are what we take as answers really building blocks to allow us to ask better questions? Does our growth come from those answers that we put in our little how and why box? Or maybe as I might suggest, our growth comes not so much from the answers as it does from the questions mm. and the asking of the questions. So do you think that we That's should kind of continue to search and find and search and find rather than search and find and stop? Stop? Tell me why. Like you mentioned in putting something into the box and then you're limited by that. So is that kind of like a stopping point? Rather yes, than that can become searching? a stopping point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That can become a stopping point. We like boxes. <laughs> I know when Reconnective Healing first came out, um, people would say, oh, another tool for my toolbox. And the funny thing about the Reconnective Healing experience, the energy, light, and information is that it's infinite. Like you are infinite. Our human experience might be finite. But the before beyond, who we were before we stepped into this human form and who we continue as is infinite. So we're having a finite experience of the infinite. Mm. So sometimes people say, oh, I think I'm going to take reconnective healing and I'm going to learn that and I'm going to add it with this and that and the other and there'll be no wonderful tools in my toolbox. And the funny thing is, is you can't place the infinite into a box, can you? So all the tools that we have and techniques give us different subsets of energy. Let's say this picture that you're looking at that I'm in, this room is filled with energy. And here's Reiki and Jirei and Jinshin and mm. Shigong and other Reikis and other Shigongs. They're all parts of energy. What if we let go of these little um, enclosures and allow the this energy to blend with that, with that, mm. with that. What we're really doing is we're discovering freedom and releasing the techniques. No, no, I'm going to focus in on my this technique and that technique and with this protection and that protection. What if we let all that go? Reconnective healing dissolves the otherness. Techniques are other. What if we dissolve the otherness? that contains or encloses those different portions of energy, then suddenly we have a fluidity mm. of the energy. It expands completely. And with reconnective healing, that's what happens. The enclosure is released. The techniques are gone. And the energy then expands beyond even energy into what science refers to as when reconnective healing as the energy, light, and information aspects of light and information that they hadn't even measured here before. So here's an example of words as we opened our conversation with. Some people like to say reconnective healing is measurable. They're correct to a degree, but they're not correct in where that word leads you. Because measurable, here's a cup that you can measure it. There's a top, there's a bottom, there's sides. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can see the middle and the end and the edges. You can measure that the reconnective healing and the energy, light and information that is reconnective healing, call it God, love, the intelligence of the universe, call it hell and it doesn't care. We can measure that it exists, but we can find no beginning, we can find no end. What yeah. we can find is that in the existence of the infinite are our energy healing techniques, are our toolboxes. You can't, the infinite can't fit in a box. But our toolboxes can certainly fit yeah. in the infinite. Mm. And sometimes it's just, we're so used to saying certain things. We don't always listen to what it means. We talk about we're running the energy. Where are you running it from, Colorado? Yeah. I mean, mm. it, it just, the energy, light, and information that is reconnective healing is. It just is. Now, just the use of that word is, I just watched your faces. See where you went? You started to look for what is is. Yes. Isn't that cool? Guess what we don't do when we hear running energy? We don't look for it. We've heard it. We've acknowledged, oh, there's a word we use, da 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 da, -da. sending yeah. love. There's a word we use, and we go on. Find 
meaning and dare to communicate it in words that might really express something mm. and see just as you're doing now now we start to explore this is our growth if we say the same thing over and over again really you know where are we going amazing hi dr eric i'm so happy to have you here with us today so I've learned so much from you about reconnective healing and I know you spoke a bit about it, but how would you explain what reconnective healing is to people? As best as possible, understanding where we've just come from in this conversation. Reconnective healing is it's freedom. It's the freedom of being. It's the release of what we talked about, of, of techniques, of limitations. It is an infinite spectrum of energy, light, and information, an intelligence that knows where to go and what to do. Something that makes us even laugh at all the different intentional approaches to healings we've had. All the times that we wanted to facilitate a healing session or receive a healing session, and we looked up, figuratively speaking, at the heavens or whatever intelligence we believe in shook our fingers and said, this is what I want. This is where I want you to go. This is what uh, the result is. This is what I want you to do when you're there, you know? And it laughs and it smiles because the most we can get from intention healing is what our limited human conscious educated minds are able to conceive of. That could be the best. And sometimes we might get closer to it than other times. What if we let go? What if we let go of trying to talk and instead listen? What if we let go of trying to receive? I mean, trying to send and instead allowed ourselves to receive. What if we let go of trying to love and instead allowed ourselves to be who we are, to be love? Because that's the truth, the essence of who we are. In other words, we might tell or attempt to tell the universe what we want, and it might smile and laugh. And if you're lucky, you might get what you think you're looking for. <laughs> and yet, what if we let go? If we're truly fortunate, we'll receive something that we hadn't even dreamed of. We couldn't even come up with something to attempt to tell the universe that we want. And it's so much finer. So what is reconnective healing? It's a letting go. It's a release. The reconnective healing experience is the discovery of who we are on the deepest, purest, freest level. Now, you're holding your microphones, but fortunately only in one hand. Let's play with the other hand for a moment, shall we? Yes, play a little we game? Shall. <laughs> okay. And not just us, but everyone watching the show. Everyone, you know, watching. And it doesn't need to be in real time. Please don't say to yourself, oh, this is a rerun. It won't work. Oh, yes, it will. Mm -hmm. The concept of a rerun is our buy into the illusion of time. So take one hand, open your fingers, Hold the skin a little bit tight. I mean, not with your other hand, but just, you know, spread your fingers enough so there's a little tightness and hold your hand still. I'm going to move my hand. You're going to keep your hand still. I might even suggest if you want to, you sort of look into your hands and look in your fingers if you want a little bit, okay? You hold your hands there. Hold your hands still, fingers wide open, okay? Good. Don't move them. I'm moving my hand a little bit. I'm not sending anything. I'm receiving. I see somebody's fingers move. Did you move them? They move themselves. Open your fingers wider. Hold them really strong. Okay? Keep them there. I'm just receiving. You're in Ireland. I'm outside of Chicago. It's true there are a lot of Irish people here, but just the same. What are you noticing? Share with me, one of you. So two of my fingers are moving, my index finger and their ring finger. They're moving by themselves. Mm -hmm. What are you aware of sensation-wise, if anything? Just 
a little bit of warmth. Yeah, how about you? Yeah, I can feel in the in the center of my hand a lot of like if there's energy moving around or my blood flow or something like sensations so, just in the center. They're getting stronger and stronger. Our intention mm -hmm. and our focus has been on the hand. Mm -hmm. That everything you're aware of is it just in your hand? No. What What are you noticing? Oh, sorry. I thought you meant is the energy just in your hand. I meant no. It's in our whole body. Do you know what we're focused on? You're feeling on the hand. it everywhere. Yeah. Uh huh. What are you aware of in your body? Uh, warmth. My body's getting warmer. Uh huh. Good. Now, close your eyes, both of you. Lean a little closer into your camera. Good. Are your eyes still or are they moving? Moving. Moving. Both of you notice that. Good. Okay. Relax. Put your hand down. It has nothing to do with whether your hand is up. It has nothing to do with where we are. It has nothing to do with this, this energy going to make it all the way down to the corner or is it going to jump onto a plane and make it to Dublin or something? It just is. Mm. Yeah. And ultimately, the energy, light, and information is you, because you simply are. Reconnective healing is the infinite, by whatever name we call it, experiencing itself as you. See, what's the one thing the infinite can't experience, as long as it's infinite? It can't experience the finite. It needs you to experience the finite. Mm -hmm. And yet ultimately, we're all a finite experience of the infinite. So that might be a little further than you intended to go with your question, but mm -hmm. you know, sometimes I ramble, sorry. <laughs> I'll stop now with your next question, <laughs> if you have one, <laughs> if you dare. <laughs> so right. how did you actually discover reconnective healing? Oh, really? I hope you read it. Your listenership is fairly open. Otherwise, you're about to lose half of them. <laughs> you want to know how? Yeah. I love okay. this story. Um, I'll just keep it to the relatively brief part. I don't want to go into all the detail. But let's just say that um, I went home from work one night, went to sleep. And about an hour later, the lamp that I had next to my bed for 10 years that never did this before turned itself on. And woke me up. And my door, which I had closed before I went to sleep, my bedroom door was open. And I felt the presence of someone in my house. It was rather clear to me. So I stealthily got up and found, got my hands on the largest knife that I could, found a can of pepper spray, which actually was empty from a self-defense class I probably took 15 years ago, but I thought it might make me look defensive. I mean, offensive, no. I can look offensive and defensive. It might make me look as if they better stay away from me. How do you mm. like that? Okay. Um, and uh, my Doberman Pinscher who decided to hide behind me. And we went searching through the house and couldn't find anyone. And so finally, even though it felt like someone was there, I decided it had to be an illusion. I went back to bed and I went to turn my lamp off. Now, I'm a little, you know, you might call OCD-ish. You know, you turn the brown button on the lamp on. You keep turning it until it clicks. You turn it off, you click it off. Click on, click off, right? And that's what I do. I click my switches. I close my drawers. My toothpaste cap is screwed on. It's not left off. Um, I went to turn that knob in the lamp, and it was not clicked on. It was only rotated enough for the light to turn itself on. I knew that wasn't me. I thought, well, they let me wake up in the morning. They let me wake up. And I went to sleep. Mm -hmm. That Monday, I went into my office. And when I walked in, the first things I remember my employees asking me, I have no idea why they asked me this, was what happened to you after the over the weekend? You look so different. You sound so different. And I thought, well, I don't know. I sort of, you know, didn't want to 
delve into all of my experience. And there was much more to that experience, as you know, if you read the book, The Reconnection. Um, so I just smiled and went into the first room, adjusted my first patient. And as a chiropractor, I would start with my patients lying on their stomach. I'd adjust them down their spine. I'd turn them over in their back, finish up their neck, and then say, now allow your eyes to close and relax for the next 30, 60 seconds or whatever. Let your adjustments settle into place before you get up. So people don't just fly right off the table, but they actually you know, allow themselves to be present. How's that for a novel idea, huh? When my first patient opened his eyes, he looked at me and he said, who came into the room while I was lying here? I said, no, no one, no one. He said, no, the person who came into the room when I had my eyes closed, I said, no one came into the room. He said, I heard them. I said, they weren't here. He said, I felt them. I said, they weren't here. We went back and forth and back and forth. And finally, he said, okay, but I knew he didn't really quite believe me. Anyway, figured he's having an odd day. Went in to see my next patient. When I finished adjusting her, she opened her eyes. She said, who came into the room when I was lying here? I said, nobody, why? And she said, the person who came in, I said, no one came in. She said, I heard them. I said, they weren't here. She said, I felt them, they weren't here. Well, let's just say that on this one day, and this was my 12th year in practice. No one had ever said this to me before. On this one day, seven different patients insisted that someone came into the room, walked around the table, ran around the table, and two of them actually looked me straight in the eye and said it felt as if someone was flying around the ceiling. Now I figured, well, no one ever said this to me before, seven patients in one day, maybe I should pay attention. But I started observing other things in my patients that started that day. I could hold my hands near them and just as your fingers started moving, their eyebrows or their eyes would dart back and forth and move or their lips would start to go or the muscles would pull at their face or their, their arms would jump up and down. And, and I found that I could sort of play with where I was and they, they, they sort of looked like marionettes, you know, I, I could really trigger it. So one, one time I had, one day I had a patient come in, uh, not a patient, a friend come and surprise me at my practice. I said, come here, you gotta see this. And as I'm walking down the hallway, you know, I, I found that I could do, play with the patients this way and then go to the next room and leave the first one still doing that and go to the next one and do that. So I walked down the hall and I said, look, and one patient was lying still. We're still out in the hall, looking out into the room. And I thought, what am I just, and their body started to move again. I thought, this is just too cool. So patients would open their eyes after these sessions and they'd say, you know, I'm seeing colors I'd never seen before. I'm smelling flowers I'd never smelled. Um, what did you do? I said, nothing. And don't tell anyone. Other patients are calling me. Mothers of children with epilepsy or cerebral palsy telling me that their kids are walking and running and playing and speaking normally again, not having seizures and not needing their medications. Now, did this happen with every single person in the world who came into my office? No. Did it happen with a very significant number? Yeah. And um, science started coming out asking to study it. And they were taking measurements of what was coming out through my hands. And that's where they started talking about aspects of light and information they hadn't seen before. And, um, you know, I thought, gee, this is, I wonder what this is. I wonder what's coming through me. Then people started asking me to teach it. I said, teach it. You've got to be insane. I'm standing there waving my hands in the air, looking like an idiot. I said, you go outside and do that. Tell me what your neighbors say about you, right? You know, it'll be more than stories about the sheep, I promise. So um, all this stuff going on, finally, so many people pushed to teach it. And I'm thinking, how can you teach it? It's, yeah. it's a gift. You know, the way we think of a gift, yeah. we're very funny. We think of a gift as ours. I don't mean mine, ours, I'm going to keep it. We just think of a gift as something that belongs to a person, that it's just something special for that one person. So I got to this first um, adult school training course. I was going to try and see if I could teach it. I had all these notes and I realized the notes were going to do me nothing. So I let everyone feel it in their hands and I started to show them how to use it and start to play. The people they would work with who were lying on the table, they would start having physical responses and they started having healing. So there was 25 people in this adult class that I then released onto an unsuspecting planet. 
and started getting so many phone calls. I had to get my very first computer to tell you this was a little while back. Um, and um, I tried not to give this a name because as I said, you can't yeah. put it in a box. And as soon as you name something, you say, this is what it is. And this is what it isn't. And uh, there were two things I definitely knew. I didn't know what it was. And I knew that I didn't know what it wasn't because it kept expanding. But the human personality, nature, the, the ego, not with negativity intended in that word. I know every time we hit the word ego, we think negative. See, that's there where we were in the beginning of our conversation again. Um, the ego is, a, is important. The ego is of value. If this here tissue was the ego, it's not as if God was working over the creation of the human being and accidentally dropped something in and went, oops, now I'll never get that out of the human. I mean, it, it's a lesson. It's, it, it's not a lesson. It's a learning tool. We learn from balancing the ego, not letting it, you know, dramatically mm. lead. But anyway, um, where was I? I was just leading you somewhere. You, you had named it, but it kept expanding. Oh, yes. We couldn't. I didn't want to name this healing. It was nameless. It's mm. nameless. People in Florida started calling it um, Eric Pearl Healing Technique. People in the Northeast of the U.S. started calling it Pearl High Frequency. People somewhere else. But everyone started creating a different name for it. And most everyone attaching my name to it. I knew, A, it wasn't about me. My name didn't belong there in it. And B, although it's nameless, giving it lots of different names is worse than allowing it to remain. Allowing it the gift of remaining nameless is one thing. Giving it different names doesn't allow us to talk about it or share about it. Yeah. So I knew I had to share it. I knew, you know, there was no benefit in me becoming one of those healers who lives in a cave in Tibet or, you know, somewhere else, you know, exclusive in the world. It was a gift for humanity. It is a gift of, of the awareness that we are. It's a gift of us being, we are awareness. We are, some people would say, you know, we're energy. Mm -hmm. You know, it used to be that the physical body was thought of as creating energy mm -hmm. or emanating consciousness or awareness. We now know that energy, awareness, such is who we are in our infinite. And then we form in the physical to have an experience of it here. And we release, we, we are the physical form of energy, of consciousness, of awareness, and therefore giving us the ability to touch the cognizant awareness that this is us, our essence, we suddenly realize that we can no longer place people on pedestals as if this is that special healer and this is that special healer. And people will say, yeah, but we, we'll see you when you present and you'll bring someone up on stage and um, to give a demonstration and they'll have all this medical history and documentation of their problem. And they've also been to six different healers and nothing happened. And they have a healing when they come to you, you have, must have some special powerful charge or energy. I said, no, you know what I have? I have the gift that you have that you're depriving yourself of. You're mm. not allowing yourself to see. I have the knowingness that came from some of the experience. It's not because I practiced and got better, but from the experience and the situations I've been in of having to demonstrate in hospitals or in public. I didn't do live demonstrations in public for the first couple of years. I didn't do them on television for the first couple of years because I didn't have the knowingness. But when you have that knowingness, once you learn reconnective healing and then step into it and allow yourself the knowingness with it, you, I can pretty much make you two promises. Promise one, you'll be able to do anything and everything in this realm of healing beyond energy healing that I can do and anything and everything in this realm that any, any human being, no matter how famous, no matter how respected, no matter what their lineage can do in this world, because it is the fame, it is the lineage, it is the technique that lets you get somewhere, but it is also the limitation. It must be released. It's the glass ceiling that must be let go of. It's the training wheels yeah. that help you learn how to ride the bicycle. And yet, as you know, you'll never master that bicycle until they come off. 
they don't, you don't get better from adding six more techniques or six more sets mm. of training wheels. Yeah. Eric, from my own experience of life <laughs> and becoming more conscious and aware and also um, been in touch with my bodily awareness through meditation, maybe since 2014, I can see my growth I can see my development or my higher level of awareness as you say as well last year I was with Ashley in Dublin and she did a reconnective healing session on me now I would be very open-minded and I've tried different things down through the years that my mother has put me on or um, has been sharing with me like Reiki or tapping different tools and I love trying everything new, anything that helps the body and anything that helps healing or health in general. So when Ashley did this on me last year, we watched one of your uh, YouTube videos so I could understand what the concept is, what reconnective healing is. And then we went about having this session. But I have to say that for me, what I felt most of all was even after years of meditation, it was the first time in my experience that I could actually feel the switch of my mind the chatter that's present nearly all day every day just switch off and I felt like we have a joke between ourselves that I went into the pond because I felt like I just that that constant chatter dissolved in a split second and then I um just felt like I was in this pure peace of mind um and it was a beautiful presence and existence to be in for that period of time and that I feel like I was much more aware of that because of my years of doing meditation and I'm just wondering do you need to have or is there any way you can prepare yourself to receive the reconnective healing or can anybody sit on the sit on a table or lie down and and receive it do you think what do you think I I, f I feel like I had a greater experience with my own I think um my openness to with my belief and I think I think I allowed myself to settle more into the session and receive from Ashton because I had that experience of meditation and being able to be present. And I thought maybe things like that would help people along the way of being able to receive reconnective healing. We do think that because mm. we're told that. Yeah. Reconnective healing doesn't care whether you believe in it or not. It just is. It's like if you take a glass and put it on your kitchen table. Your table is going to catch and support that glass. And I can pretty much promise you the glass doesn't believe or isn't open to the table. <laughs> it won't handle it any better whether you've taught the glass to meditate and relax and let go and be. Mm -hmm. than if you just took it out of a box and put it on the table. Because it is, you know, when people first started coming in to, um, when I was on television, before there were any books um, on reconnective healing, they'd come in and every once in a while, there'd be someone who would look at me and say, I think this is a pile of garbage. I wouldn't be here if my husband or wife didn't make me come. I think it's ridiculous and you're a quack and you, you, all these things. And I said, well, you, you know what? You're here. Your wife drove you out from halfway across the country. You're going to have a nice week in Los Angeles, where I was at the time. So guess what? For half an hour, lie down, close your eyes, say to yourself, maybe it's real and maybe it's ridiculous and let go. Have a nice rest and then go on with your day. These people would have some of the most dramatic healings. If anyone struggled to see what they recognized, it wasn't the person who didn't believe in it. It was the person who came in saying, I know this works. It has to work. I've got all the right color crystals strung at the right heights over my proper chakras. I'm sleeping with healing books under my um, pillow and, and magnets under my mattress. And it's like, let go. This doesn't need any help. We're not helping by doing that. We're trying instead of allowing and receiving. So sometimes comes judgment. I'm more open than someone else because I've meditated, because I believe in it. Just let it go. Did you do the same meditation as someone else? Did you have the same experience as someone else? This is so, we are so indoctrinated 
into this belief. And it's not that this makes us bad people, but it is different variations on the concept of judgment. And judgment in itself is a limitation. Now, I would have believed exactly as you did if I didn't see this for myself. But when I started doing this, my patients were coming and going, what the hell is this? They never believed in it. They weren't looking for this. They wanted a chiropractor. And I thought I was one. You know, I went home <laughs> that night before the lamp turned on. I thought I was a doctor. And, you know, there I was. I woke up the next morning and I was something else. My parents always told me I was something else, but this was probably not what they were thinking. Um, and a lot of times people will go, this is ridiculous. I'm not going to do it. But there it was. So isn't it nice to know that something is instead of that we have to intend it into existence. We have to do the right things. We have to be the right way. Um, and then we have to learn the rules of how the healings work even better. You know, people will come in there, oh, I better take my belt buckle off because it's so big. It might, you know, block the energy. And I'm thinking to myself, could you imagine Mother, Father, God floating over clouds saying, I'd really love to send Sarah a healing, but that belt buckle, I'll never get through it. I mean, the, the <laughs> silliest thing. That, that we say and we do and we mm. act on things even when we're consciously we can say all right um i realize that i don't need to call in helper entities and this that and the other and do all these things but and i'll, I'll say sometimes when we're, when we're teaching presentations i'll say how many think though even though you know all that that we should at least call in god and of course everyone smiles raises their hand we should call in god to the healing session sounds good Great. How many of you know that God is everywhere? Same hands going. So, well, if God is everywhere, where are you calling God in from? A department store? I mean, it's already every. So sometimes our thoughts, our physical actions, and our conceptual thoughts, sometimes we might just want to take a moment and say, are they matching our true beliefs? Are they matching the words we espouse. And I'm not saying it's always the most fun discovery mm -hmm. because sometimes that exploration can be a little uncomfortable. Maybe we're not sure we want to unearth some of what we are about to reveal to ourselves. Yeah. But wow, once we get it, now who do we become? That's really cool.